A recent email really captured my attention. The title of it was Fear and Loathing in Bethlehem. The following tagline precisely expressed my sentiments. As a Christian, I love Christmas, but as a preacher, I dread it. Pastor Paul Hoffman writes these words, Surveys indicate that 75% of Americans like Christmas. I wish I were one of them. Let me explain. As a follower of Jesus, I love the season of Advent and enjoy Christmas, pondering the incarnation's mystery, beauty, and power is compelling and moving to me. And I delight in all this holy season offers, including decorating our Christmas tree, singing hymns, sipping hot cocoa, watching sappy movies, and reading Jesus' birth story before my two sons denude their carefully wrapped presents at an ungodly hour nonetheless. However, when I switch roles and put on my preacher's hat, a pall comes over me, dashing all my happy vibes. Numerous challenges in the form of inner scripts bombard my brain, such as thought number one. Uh-oh, what theme should I preach on? And there are so few texts to work with. Let's see, I've got Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, John 1, Isaiah 7 and 9, and a few other Old Testament passages. Ugh. Thought number two, Advent is the four Sundays before Christmas. That's four weeks rehashing the same narrow subject. Didn't I already mention there's so little material to work with? Well, we solved one of the Sundays of Advent because it was last week and we were still doing John last week. So we cut it down a little bit. And because of the so-called creasters, creasters, Christmas Easter attendees only, Christmas Eve has to be a standalone sermon. Even better, in 2022, Christmas is on a Sunday. So that's six different sermons in 28 days. And John was just sharing with you how as we looked at that Christmas Sunday, instead of um, introducing to you the, the tension of trying to decide, do we go to church or what do we do? So instead of saying, uh, come and worship here, we decided to bring it to you. Uh, with this video where you'll be able to hopefully use that wherever you are to spend. We're going to try to, we're going to be about 25 to 30 minutes is the goal to be able to have that Christmas worship with your family. It also took one Sunday off where I don't have to come up with a full sermon, a gift to me. Thought number three, how do I make the Christmas story interesting and fresh for the congregation when familiarity breeds contempt? Even unchurched people have a basic grasp of the events surrounding Jesus' birth. They do. And finally, thought number four, how do I get motivated to preach about the same thing for the 16th time in a row? And actually, I'm well past 16 times. And so hopefully this will help you understand what may seem to be a weird take on Christmas this year. This year, I'm inviting you to consider God's big purpose of sending His Son into the world to bring reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is not the weird idea. The way we're going to get there may seem to be that. Writing to the church in Corinth, Paul underscores this purpose. All this is from God, he writes, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. It's in reconciliation where barriers to community get torn down. Uh, people who were estranged and divided, they, they get reunited uh, hostility and woundedness get replaced with healing and goodwill. Uh, the old prophets of Israel, they longed for reconciliation. They said that the world thirsted for it. They said, when the Messiah, when God's anointed comes, he will bring reconciliation. It's a theme that's so deeply felt that the master artist and the musicians, they imagine it for us. They create masterpieces to communicate the wonder of what God did, what he still does as he seeks to reconcile. 
They use these pictures of peace coming, not just to human beings, but to all of God's creatures and to all of God's creation, experiencing peace and shalom. The prophet Isaiah, in talking about the coming of the Messiah, says, it will look like this. The wolf will lie down with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling together. No violence, no pain, a little child, a little child, powerless, will lead them. When we imagine reconciliation happening in our world on a grander scale, we we think, well, at least I think, what would it be like for North and South Korea to live together as one in peace? What if Russia and Ukraine would operate with respect for one another? What would it be like for the Israelis and Palestinians to live in harmony? Do we dare even think thoughts like that to have those dreams of what God wants to do in his world through Jesus? In our own country, What would it be like if the wounds of 250 years of race slavery and another 100 years of Jim Crow laws and lynching and years of racial injustice got healed? Or we may imagine in a more personal way for our friends, friends who are married, and there's there's been this estrangement for a lot of years. Estrangement that runs so deeply that they physically, reflexively pull away from each other when touched. And then they find their marriage being miraculously healed by the reconciler. Visions of being reconciled capture our hearts because divisions hurt us so much in in families, marriages, workplaces, schools, and in our nation. Way too often, even religious groups, spiritual communities, and Christians become one more divisive faction trying to exert power over other groups. And that is why spiritually, personally, socially, and systematically, the crying need for our world is to be reconciled as God intended. And we can't seem to do it. But it's at the heart of the Christmas story. It's at the heart of the Bible's redemptive story. So here's why we're doing this. I think, I think the best part of Christmas is that time when families get together. I also think the hardest part of this time of the year is that time when families get together. We all grew up in families, and families often, well, have issues. And that certainly was the case for the covenant family in Genesis. Here's a, here's a short summary of what happens in Genesis. In the very first family, Cain, the older brother, kills the younger brother, Abel. A couple of generations later, we meet Lamech, who introduced polygamy to the world. He was also a murderer. Uh, Next, we read about Noah getting drunk and turning his family into a train wreck after surviving the flood. This is followed by Abraham having a child with his wife's maid. Uh, Jacob deceives his father and steals his twin brother's inheritance. Uh, Jacob has 12 sons by two wives and two of the servants. And he favors one Joseph so much that the other sons, they kidnap him, wanting to kill him. One of the brothers, Judah, convinces his brothers to sell him into slavery and then cover the robes, his robe with goat's blood to convince their father, Jacob, that Joseph has been killed. These are families who made it into the Bible. So this morning, you can sit up straight. You can sit up straight because your family is doing better than you might think. Reading this, we discover this. In God's plan, everybody is welcome. Nobody is perfect. Anything is possible. Everybody is welcome. Nobody is perfect. Anything is possible. And in the middle of all of this is an account we're going to look at today briefly. Let me make clear, this is a Christmas story. You're not going to think so. It's going to seem weird, but it is a Christmas story. It's found in Genesis 38. 
where Judah leaves his brothers and he goes down to a place called Adullam and he marries a Canaanite girl. Uh, to a reader in ancient Israel, this would scream trouble. They knew this was describing a broken family because you didn't leave your brothers. And marrying a Canaanite girl meant you were choosing idolatry and being unfaithful to God. Right from the start, it's clear that Judah is going down the wrong road. Judah and his wife, whose name we never learn, they have three boys, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. We're told how Judah arranged a wife for Ur, his firstborn, named Tamar. Tamar, Ur, the firstborn, he was wicked, so the Lord causes his death. And reading the passage, you will notice how the writer twice identifies Ur as Judah's firstborn because it's a fact that we need to know. Uh, even in our day, uh, firstborns tend to be found in leadership-type positions in disproportion disproportional uh, amounts. Uh, they're the leaders and the achievers. Well, in the ancient world, they would inherit almost everything in the family. They got all the good stuff. And that's why he is named Ur. He is handsomer, smarter, and stronger. <laughs> Andy Stanley says we all want to live in the land of Ur. It turns out, however, that he is wickeder, and he exits the story faster. So it's a story that's filled with intrigue. It's marked by subterfuge. In the ancient world, a woman's, when a, husband, a woman's husband died, her father-in-law was obligated to have her marry the next oldest son. It was their version of a, a social safety net. This was the way that she would be provided for. Uh, that responsibility falls to Onan, and in this polygamous culture, he was to add Tamar to his wives for the purpose, for the purpose of giving his older brother a son through her, a son who would receive his brother's firstborn inheritance, which if there is no son, he would now be receiving for himself. So he figures out a way to cheat Tamar and protect himself by not fully consummating the relationship and leaving her to carry the cultural shame of being childless. As a result of his wicked scheming, Onan also dies. Now remember, th this is in the Bible. It's in Genesis 38, and it is a Christmas story that you can read to your children if they're in their 20s. The people in that day would see Tamar as a tragic victim. She wanted a good thing by bringing a child into the world, a world that was marked by a low survival rate, so each child really mattered. There was also the fact that she would become a part of the people of God, that she would be in their lineage. So she's been given two wicked men as husbands who both die. She is still childless. And Judah is still responsible to have her now marry his third son, Shelah, who is much, much younger. So Judah tells Tamar to go and wait until it's time. But we also are told by the writer there is no intention that he's ever going to follow through by doing that. So at some later time, Judah's wife dies. Judah wastes very little time mourning. Step back for just a moment, and there's a fascinating contrast here between his story and the Joseph story. Uh, when, Jacob, when Jacob thinks that Joseph has died, Jacob mourns, and he refuses to be comforted. Well, Judah doesn't mourn for very long, and he's ready to be comforted. He is ready for a woman in his life. He's not an e-harmony kind of guy, though. He's more of a Tinder guy. He, he swipes right, which involves going down to Timna, where he could find what he was looking for. Tamar hears this, and she goes into action. She disguises herself as a prostitute, wearing a veil so that she won't be recognized. Judah comes by and propositions her with the offer of a young goat, which was a valuable asset. Valuable asset. I, I remember 
how moving it was as an illustration when Mike Silva, on our, the first trip to the Dominican, he presented a goat to a person listening in the crowd, listening to him speak in that crowd because a goat means milk and cheese. It means stability. Tamar asked for his seal uh, that you would mark documents with and the cord to which it was attached and his staff as collateral. And so he agrees, and the transaction is finalized. Now, remember, this is a Christmas story that you can tell to your kids if they're in their 40s. <laughs> Judah, Judah will be both the father of Tamar's children and Tamar's father-in-law. That means that she will be their mother and their sister-in-law. How much more messed up could it be? Your family is incredible by comparison. Well, Judah goes home, and he tries to ship the goat as payment, but the FedEx guy can't find her. And Judah is relieved because now no one will know that he's been with a prostitute. Several months pass. Judah hears that Tamar's pregnant. She isn't married. She has gotten herself pregnant. And Judah, having no idea who the father is, he says, bring her out and have her burned to death. Yeah, even in that time, this is remarkably brutal. In fact, this is such an artfully told story in the original that there are two words used. Bring, burn. Bring, burn. They bring, but before they can light the match, she sends the seal, the cord, and the staff with this message. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. See if you recognize whose these are. I think she could have added, ring any bells, Dad? There are so many incredible stories to this Christmas story that you can tell your kids. Probably if they're in their 60s, actually. Remember, it was Judah who devised the scheme to sell his brother Joseph into slavery. And he took Joseph's robe of many colors to his father, after it had been dipped in blood with this message. See if you recognize whose robe this is. The very same language that he had used with his father all those years before is now used by Tamar to confront Judah. Recognize, the word recognize ends up being a big word in this story. And in your life and my life. In a single sentence, Judah is forced to recognize his treachery and the brokenness it's caused not only for his daughter-in-law, but also for his father and his brothers decades earlier. Genesis tells us Judah recognized them. Duh. Really? But it's his acknowledgement that's significant. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Shelah. The execution's called off. Tamar lives. She gives birth to twins. There's another interesting struggle where the second-born son ends up being the one through whom the lineage of Abraham's family flows. So, so make a note of the fact that this rejected Canaanite woman, Tamar, becomes a part of God's great story of redemption. So with all of that, what's the moral of the story? I suppose you could put it this way. If you're a woman and your first husband dies from wickedness and you marry his brother who refuses to impregnate you, so he also dies, and your father-in-law won't let you marry the third son, just wait for your mother-in-law to die and then pretend to be a prostitute and have your father-in-law's twin sons, which all result in a happy ending to the glory of God. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's such a weird story. But it's in the Bible, and it's an incredible story of reconciliation, the reconciliation that God wants to establish between people because of his love. People who are religious, we can get a bit squeamish even reading this story in public. Couldn't Tamar have found a more wholesome way to deal with her situation? Uh, she could have sold Mary Kay or essential oils or learned how to do computer programming, anything else would have been better. The Bible never really explains why this happened. 
It simply accepts the reality that the ancient world was a pretty brutal place, just like our world is today. These are not virtuous fables told simply to teach us a lesson. They are real people in a real world where there is great evil that divides us and the honest reader is left to puzzle things out. And so we come to a Christmas lesson about reconciliation. A story that features a desperate woman, marginalized, pushed to the edges by her world. We must be careful to recognize the major character in this story, God himself. God cares about insignificant Tamar. He is intent on creating a redemptive, reconciling community. He waits to reconcile people so that they can be with him and with one another. He can use even wicked old Judah to accomplish his work. Judah acknowledges Tamar is more righteous than he is. It is the beginning of a glimmer of decency in him. Move ahead to many years later. Judah and his brothers are with Joseph again. They don't recognize Joseph, but he recognizes them. In a moment that changes the trajectory of the human race, scholars point to Judah as playing a central role in introducing forgiveness Forgiveness into our world, forgiving one another as the crowning moment at the conclusion of the book of Genesis. But that's next week. That's next week. Come back for that. You won't want to miss that Christmas story. We need to finish with Tamar this morning. Tamar gives birth to twins. What happens to Tamar? Uh, the writer of Genesis tells us nothing more. She disappears from the scene, never appears again. It's more than 1,500 years later. She's once again mentioned by Matthew in his biography of Jesus. This, we read, is the genealogy of Jesus. This comes from one of those two chapters where you can actually get material about Christmas, Matthew 1. Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Quite a lineage. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Are you kidding me? She is in the story. Matthew brings her up. He doesn't mention any other mothers before this. Why Tamar? Now, if you're anything like I am, and heaven forbid that that would be true for you. You probably don't spend a lot of time studying genealogies, uh, unless you want to take a good nap, maybe. We, we make jokes about them, as in a recent uh, Babylon Bee. Do you, do you know the Babylon Bee? You ever, any of you read the Babylon Bee? Uh, the gift of sarcasm is big for the Babylon Bee. Here's what this read. A recent edition of the Bee tells of a man sweating bullets at the gates of heaven because Simon Peter has asked him how many warriors were in the tribe of Simeon during the Exodus. I don't know, the man stammered when confronted with the biblical pop quiz, kind of like one of the quizzes before church starts. I spent my entire life reading the Bible regularly, but... I usually just skip stuff, like the genealogies and numbering of the tribes. Were we really supposed to read those? For his part, Simon Peter remained stone-faced as he waited for the man's answer. Oh, you don't know the answer either, eh? Uh, Peter was from the northern tribe, so he had that Canadian, eh? Simon Peter asked the man incredulously, I guess you also won't be able to tell me the number and types of animals each tribe gave as offerings for the consecration of the tabernacle. What about telling me which tribes of Israel were cramped, camped on the north side of the tent of meeting? Seriously, did you ever read your Bible? The Bible in line behind, they were said to be frantically searching for a Bible to do some cramming before they were asked a similar question by Peter. 
And then finally, as of publishing time, Peter was suspended from gate duty when it was discovered he didn't know the answer to the questions either. Well, for people in that day, genealogies were how they learned who they were. They would memorize those to pass on to the next generation. So picture Matthew as he's writing. He hasn't Googled the family tree. He isn't even using notes. He's simply writing down what he has memorized because this is important. It tells the readers, we are somebody. We are God's people. We share in this story together. And Hebrew genealogies didn't typically involve women. But Matthew's does. Tamar, with her checkered past, isn't the woman you would expect to be included. She is a Canaanite woman who tricks her father-in-law into sleeping with her, and she is the one included in the family tree of the Messiah. This means, this means Jesus is not a pure-blooded our guy. He's also their guy. And he has Canaanite blood that ends up bleeding out from him on the cross, bringing people together. Tamar isn't the only woman in the story. Ruth is there. She was a Moabite. Moabites were hated by Israel. There is no way the Messiah would have Moabite blood. Matthew says, well, he did. He did. Bathsheba, also mentioned, as God uses David's adulterous affair to eventually produce the Messiah of grace. Finally, there's Rahab, not only a Gentile, a Gentile prostitute. And I think it's like Matthew he, Matthew decides to identify the most disreputable characters in God's story and he pushes them into the spotlight so they won't be missed. Let's not miss them and what they mean this Christmas. And so I asked the question, why? Why would Matthew do this? It's because God's Spirit has a life-altering message for anyone who reads this account. The time has come for God to proclaim the good news of his gospel through his son Jesus. It's through Jesus we are going to find out that everybody is welcome, nobody is perfect, anything is possible. God is reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, not counting my sins against me. The sinners and the saints are all jumbled together in God's story. Outsiders aren't left outside anymore. God brings them in. And if God can reconcile and bring together Judah and Tamar, Israelite and Canaanite, saints and sinners, patriarchs and prostitutes, oppressors with the oppressed, Is there anyone who lies beyond the reconciling power of God through Jesus? There's no one. Praise God, there is no one who lies outside of that. Because as part of Jesus' story, it turns out that Tamar's story is a Christmas story where the most unlikely people are brought from the outside to the inside where they worship Jesus. At Christmas, we celebrate how Jesus has been doing this for the past 2,000 years. This morning, we are going to celebrate that marvelous truth at the Lord's table. Hopefully, you picked up your symbols of communion. We celebrate today having a heavenly Father, a heavenly Father who loves you, and for reasons only God may know, He wants to be with you. He wants it so much, he sent his only son. Yes, born in that stable. 
But so much it was meaning there to be reconciled so that we could be reconciled with God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. If you're honest with God, kind of like Judah, there's some stuff in your relationship with the Father that may need to be fixed. It may be a behavior that you hope no one finds out about. Or maybe a relationship that is taking you in the wrong direction, totally away from God. God wants you to know today, everybody is welcome. Nobody is perfect. Anything, anything is possible.